presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from ProCopy, leading the way in educational printing and publishing in State College since 1990, now in their new location next to Wiscoy in the Aaron Plaza. Online at ProCopyOnline.com. ProCopy Courseworks. You need copies, we can help. Additional support comes from the members of WPSU. The studios of Penn State Public Broadcasting, this is to the best of my knowledge. Good evening, I'm Graham Spanier. Tonight we'll be talking about immigration. More than 11 million undocumented immigrants live in the United States, and more arrive each day, putting a strain on health education services, but also providing what some say is a necessary flow of labor into the U.S. Meanwhile, polls show that the majority of Americans want less immigration, even legal immigration. Are people concerned about immigration primarily for economic reasons or because of security and cultural issues? More generally, who tends to be against immigration and why? We'll talk about that and more. We'll also take your phone calls at 1-800-543-8242. Eight two four two. You can also reach us via email at response at psu.edu. Now let's meet our guests. Joining us in the studio are Victor Romero, Associate Dean of Penn State's Dickinson School of Law, where he teaches and writes in the area of immigrant and minority rights, and David Shapiro, a Penn State professor of economics and demography, and joining us later in the program by telephone from his home in Virginia will be Steve Camerata, Director of Research for the Center for Immigration Studies. I want to thank you both for being with us now right here in the studio. Well, over the last three decades, according to my data, 25 million people have left their homelands and legally, legally emigrated to the United States. I guess our first question then is, why do they come and uh, where predominantly are they coming from? I, I, I think the, the reasons why people come are really the same reasons that have motivated immigration for a long, long time, and that is people in search of a better life. One main difference is that much of it now is economic oriented rather than, for example, the historical fleeing religious persecution. In terms of where they come, in recent years, or if one looks at data on the foreign-born population in the United States, um, above 30 percent of that population is from Mexico. Another 22 or 23 percent are from the Caribbean, Central America, and South America. So a little over half of the foreign-born are from Mexico and elsewhere in South and Latin America. Another good chunk, about 23 percent from South and East Asia, um, and then 3 percent from the Middle East and 20 percent all other. So mm -hmm. they, they come from a wide variety of places, but quite different from what was the case, say, 30, 40, or 50 years ago when there was much heavier European immigration to the U.S. and much less from Latin America and other parts of the world. Now, once they're here in the U.S., the six states where they seem to uh, congregate the, in the largest numbers would be New York, New Jersey, California, Florida, Texas, and Illinois. Now, apart from those being some of our larger states, um, can you say anything about why the concentration in those particular states? Well, immigration, generally speaking, has not changed much in terms of the economic reasons. Um, uh, and in addition, if we take a look back historically as to why people move to the United States. Uh, oftentimes what we'd have is a whole village from, say, the old world transplanted into the new world. Uh, for example, Germantown, Pennsylvania uh, was founded by a group of Germans who came to uh, as an area in Pennsylvania and, and 
uh, established themselves there. So I think that you see uh, a lot of family ties, and indeed our immigration law uh, has that as a particular emphasis uh, to make sure that families remain united. Right here in Pennsylvania, we've had a community that uh, wanted to pass its own set of laws to, to deal with immigration, uh, on the surface apparently designed to keep people out. Uh, is there much of that going on around the country right now, and how do you react to it? Yeah, I think that's going to be, Dr. Spanier, one of the largest issues facing uh, the law today in terms of immigration, and that is the tension between federal and state control over immigration. Uh, as you can well imagine, because one immigrates to the United States, that law is controlled by federal law. That is, it's a national law that governs the entrance and the exit of non-citizens. But time and again, we are seeing state and local governments wanting to play a larger role in immigration because they feel that the federal government has failed them. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shapiro, can you comment on some of the economic aspects of this. Great, I'm glad you asked that question because I was gonna say I wanna go back to that, yeah. the, the earlier question. The, the six states that primarily draw people are of course some of our larger states, but they're states with very strong economies by and large. And so they're states where there are job opportunities for immigrants in many cases. And those immigrants, as, as Dr. Romero said a moment ago, um, essentially what you get are migration flows that create migration networks. So you have immigrants who come, who follow other people who often, as he suggested, come from the same area, even the same village. And that facilitates um, basically um, getting set up, if you will, in a new environment. Now there's this at least stereotypical view that the economics involve immigrants coming in and taking our low wage jobs that perhaps there aren't enough Americans uh, to fill. Uh, to what extent is that accurate, and to what extent does that explain some of the economics surrounding this? It, it, it is true that over, uh, that par it, it's partially relevant, um, in part because educational attainment in the United States has been growing substantially over time. So our labor force is getting better educated. By and large, the, the educational demands for jobs have also been increasing, but there's still a good number of jobs that need to be done that do not require high levels of education. So we've got a native-born labor force where um, only about 8% of the population has less than a high school diploma. Um, we, we now have an, an immigrant pool, if you will, where something in excess of 30% so almost four times as, as many uh, do not have a high school diploma. So it is true that immigrants are indeed filling a lot of low-skill jobs. Um, the extent to which they are crowding out natives is, is hard to, to determine, however. It's a debatable issue, basically. Mm. Now the polls show that a majority of Americans want less immigration, even legal immigration. So it, it raises the question of uh, whether uh, security, cultural issues, issues of discrimination, other variables quite apart from the economics are what's driving the public attitudes. Comments on that? Sure, I, I think one thing that we have to remember and Dr. Shapiro hinted at this is that we really now have a very different immigrant stream than we did pre-1965. Mm -hmm. In 1965, Congress passed a law which abolished the national origins quota system, which pegged immigration based on a percentage of the population who are already here. And so that really opened up immigration from Asia and Latin America. So to that extent, we have to ask ourselves whether uh, some of this might be motivated by a perception of difference, of otherness, if you will. But that, that 1965 change in legislation indeed was a landmark because it also represented a move towards policy that emphasized family reunification rather than the labor force characteristics of prospective immigrants. So we've gone away from s effectively soliciting immigrants who have skills, high level skills in demand in the labor market to trying to facilitate, um, again, family reunification. But to go back to your point about the sources of objection, I, it, again, it seems to me that there are uh, sort of diverse sources. In part, 
U.S. natives with low levels of education who are, indeed are the individuals most adversely affected by the current flow of, of immigrants have very good reason to be concerned about immigration because there is in essence a certain degree of competition for jobs taking place. But on the cultural side, I think for a lot of people, particularly with the growth in the immigrant population, there's concern about what is often perceived as a lack of assimilation. And so, that, so I think there are cultural concerns that underlie for some people, not necessarily those threatened by jobs, um, by job competition, but that, that underlie some of the hostility mm -hmm. towards, towards immigration. Our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242, and we welcome you to call now and join this discussion. We're going to begin with uh, Walter, who is on the line from Warren, Pennsylvania. Hello, Walter. Thanks for joining us. President Spanier, again, thank you for taking my call. As I'm sure you, uh, well, maybe you don't recall, but I'm a constant uh, gadfly to your program. You, you are one of our regulars, and we appreciate your loyalty to the program. <laughs> uh, I, I, I so much enjoy the intellectual stimulation. And to my question, I was wondering when, in the course of American history, have immigrants ever been welcomed? I mean, my ancestors are German, and, uh, you know, you hear stories about uh, the Germans being, well, less than welcomed. Uh, there's still uh, an Italian Anti-Defamation League because the Italians weren't exactly welcomed in the United States. Uh, you know, the various uh, different ethnic groups, uh, they've had a hard time. The, the Irish, they got less than optimally paying jobs throughout their history. I mean, when has the United States ever welcomed it's immigrants. I think it's a great question. You know, we, we talk with such great pride about the immigrants who made this country what it is. And of course, except for the Native Americans, perhaps, we're all immigrants or ancestors of, of immigrants. And that's a, a big part of what the U.S. is about. But uh, we tend to look back, don't we, with some nostalgia at the whole phenomenon of immigrant until the last maybe decade or two. But actually, Walter raises a point that it probably was never what it was cracked up to be in terms of public acceptance and open arms towards immigration. I, I'd welcome a comment from each of you on that. Uh. I think that's exactly right. Uh, Walter makes an excellent point. He mentioned, for example, a couple of groups, for example, the Irish, whom now everyone would consider to be uh, white by designation, both in terms of their status in society generally and in terms of how they're welcomed. But certainly they were not as well favored uh, as, for example, the Anglo-Saxons, and then after them, the Chinese, the Mexicans, and so forth. And so I think that there is that tendency, and perhaps a tendency of human nature, to distrust that which we, we don't uh, un fully understand. And so I think uh, I, I, I do agree with that. Dr. Shapiro. Yes, I, I think the first century wasn't too bad. But if my memory serves me well, I, I, I'm not quite sure, but my understanding is that the initial, some of the initial legislation pertaining to em immigration began in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, but the, the quotas that Dr. Romero referred to, which had been, which were abolished in the 1960s, had been begun either at the tail end of the 19th century or early in the 20th century and experienced modifications as the flow of immigrants changed. So when more immigrants started coming from Italy and other parts of Southern Europe, uh, changes were made in national quotas that basically tried to keep those, those immigrants out or, or keep their numbers limited. Um, so again, your point, Walter, is a very good one that, that we have in fact a long history of uh, very mixed feelings about immigration despite the, the, the normal view that we're a land of immigrants. Uh, some of the data I have show that in 1970, which for some of us wasn't that long ago, there were 9.6 million immigrants in the United States. Now there are 36.2 million and the population of the U.S., as we know, is just about 300 million. So that's a, a pretty good, good sized number. But uh, according to the Immigration and Naturalization Service, 400 to 500,000 uh, illegal aliens are coming to the U.S. each year, which is about a fourth or a third of all immigrants. So that raises the question, 
how are they getting here and why so many and with the great concern that this nation has apparently about immigration um, what's happening that allows such a substantial flow well the, the the first thing to remember is that people have an image of the undocumented person or the so-called illegal alien as someone who sneaks across the border but one can become undocumented or fall out of status by coming here on a legal visa and then overstaying uh, beyond the, the requisite stay by law. And so fifth, a full 50% of people who are here without the proper documents actually came here legally first. Mm. And so I think that uh, we need to understand what that, what that makeup looks like. And as, as Dr. Shapiro had mentioned earlier, a lot of that pull is either because of economic reasons or because of family ties, especially post-1965. Right, I think that the, the networks that I mentioned earlier in conjunction with the family ties are certainly one part that, that facilitates the, the ongoing entry of, of people who are not uh, adequately documented, if you will, not legal, legal immigrants. Mm -hmm. But it's also the case over the period that you're talking about uh, that the volume of legal immigration has grown substantially. Um, I believe that it's something close to a million a year at present. I, I, in 1970, it was much less than that, and I don't have the number on my fingertips, but you know, at, at the tip of my mm -hmm. tongue. But I think it may be something in the neighborhood of th perhaps 300,000. So if that's correct, we've had a tripling or more yes. uh, of legal immigration during that time. I that think one, one one last point that I'd like to make too, and th something that we shouldn't forget, is the fact that uh, there are lots of non-immigrants uh, who come to this country. In other words, if we think about the uh, ebb and flow of people into the United States who are not U.S. citizens, uh, a full 90 or 95 percent of those folks actually go back. So when we're talking about the immigrant population, it's actually quite small as a percentage of uh, mm -hmm. non-citizens generally. Right. Let's take a call now from Herb, who's calling from State College. You're on the air with us. Thank you. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Uh, my question uh, for Dr. Spanier and for Dr. Romero and for Dr. Shapiro has to do with the uh, studies of the economic impact of immigration in the United States, both in local communities on specific groups and uh, the overall economic impact in the United States. Do we have any studies that enable us to say where the positive and negative impacts are Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Okay, thanks, Herb. Dr. Shapiro, should we give okay. you the first shot at that? Thanks very much. I mean, certainly positive impacts would be in the labor market and the labor market for low-skilled workers. Um, there are several key industries in this country, um, agriculture, construction, um, leisure, if you will, and, and you know, food services um, that operate with a very high utilization of immigrants. So there are some people who argue that, and certainly many of the employers in those industries would argue that they would have great difficulty operating if not for the availability of immigrants, legal and I illegal. So on the plus side, uh, certainly providing labor, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, our native labor force is growing in education levels, but we still have lots of jobs that require low levels of education. Lots of immigrants fill those jobs. At the same time, on the economic side, there is a there are a lot of studies that try to look at the balance of taxes paid and benefits paid out to taxes paid by immigrants and benefits paid out um, to immigrants in the form of social services. And that literature is. <laughs> is hard to summarize. I mean, I have seen people who have characterized it as saying it's, it's basically a wash, yeah. that there's not much of a difference between what uh, immigrants uh, take out of the system, if you will, versus what they put into the system. And I've seen other studies that suggest, well, it's not quite a wash, that on balance there's a net negative effect. Mm -hmm. But of course, that ignores the kind of benefits that all consumers enjoy from lower costs of restaurant meals and construction and so forth because of the availability of that labor. I think the only point that I'll add to Dr. Shapiro's uh, analysis is 
again, that point about state and local governments. I think we're seeing a lot of claims right now that state and local governments are feeling a specific impact, especially from undocumented migration, but there hasn't really mm -hmm. been much study to link uh, specific impacts on communities from undocumented migration. Well, thank you. If, if you're just joining us, I'm Graham Spanier, president of Penn State, and this is to the best of my knowledge on WPSU, Penn State Public Broadcasting, and PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Our topic is immigration with guest Victor Romero, Associate Dean of Penn State's Dickinson School of Law and the author of Alienated, Immigrant Rights, the Constitution and Equality in America, and David Shapiro, Penn State Professor of Economics and Demography. And now joining us by telephone from his home in Virginia is Steve Camerata, Director of Research for the Washington, D.C.-based Center for Immigration Studies. Now, if you have thoughts or questions you want to share with us, give us a call at 1-800-543-8242, or you may email us at response at psu.edu. Dr. Camerata, thank you for joining us by telephone from Virginia. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're joining us uh, just at the point where we're talking about some of the issues relating to the economics uh, surrounding immigration, and uh, you perhaps heard our studio guest give an initial comment in response to a viewer. Yeah. Uh, would you like to uh, add something to that discussion about the economic balance and issues at play here? Right. Um, well, in general, what we find when we look at the economics, putting aside the fiscal effects of immigration, is the main effect of immigration overall is to increase significantly the supply of less educated workers, especially those who don't have a high school education. Now, this, of course, in economics, if you increase the supply of something, generally you lower its price, and the price of labor is wages. So what seems to be happening is immigration is negatively affecting the 10 to 15, maybe even 20 percent of the U.S. workforce who either lack a high school education or have only a high school education but are quite young. Um, the level of wage reduction for these uh, less educated poor workers uh, is a matter of some debate. Um, but nonetheless, we think that it can be significant. In terms of the economic gain, now remember those wages don't vanish in the thin air. Those lower wages for the poor in the United States should translate into lower prices for consumers or higher profits for businesses. But we think it's pretty trivial because the bottom end of the labor market accounts for such a small fraction of economic output. In other words, we pay the poor so little to begin with that the economic gains uh, are very small, or in the words of the nation's kind of top immigration uh, economist, George Borjas at Harvard, the benefits to the rest of us are minuscule. But the loss to the bottom can be quite significant. So one of the big questions on immigration is how do you feel about the impact on the poorest American workers weighed against, say, the benefit the immigrant gets by coming here and the very tiny impact on consumers. Because remember, the bottom 10 percent or even the bottom 15 percent account for less than 5 percent of economic output. So even if wages are a lot lower at the bottom end because you've added all these immigrants, you can't get a big boost to the economy. On the fiscal side, that is taxes paid and public uh, and services used, there's actually a pretty clear consensus in the literature that the education level of the immigrant is what matters most. Immigrants who come with lots of education, not surprisingly, have high wages, pay lots in taxes, and don't use a lot in services. Immigrants who come with relatively little education obviously have relatively low wages, tend to pay relatively little in taxes, even when they're paid on the books, and do uh, tend to use a lot in services. In the case of illegal aliens, they tend to use a fair amount in services on behalf of their U.S. born children, who of course have American uh, citizenship. So uh, it's a mixed picture. The debate is what happens when you put all the immigrants together, the, uh, the high-skilled and the low-skilled. Uh, the National Research Council, for what it's worth, has done probably the most definitive study. That was in the late 90s. They estimated that immigrant households created a net fiscal drain of about $20 billion. That was the difference between what they paid in taxes and used in services. But all of that drain was from workers who had only a high school degree or had failed to graduate, uh, graduate high school. You know, in, uh, <clears throat> over the summer I was visiting with a mushroom farmer in Pennsylvania, and uh, he, all of his workers are immigrants, uh, legal, he believes, uh, and they 
seem to work very hard and very long hours, and they send a lot of money home to Mexico. Uh, is that typical that a lot of immigrant workers are sending money home, and how does that tie into some of the economic issues, Dr. Shapiro? Yes, well, it's very common for migrants uh, to send money home. Um, you know, in the literature, this is referred to as mi simply as migrant remittances. Mm -hmm. And such remittances, uh, in some cases, can be a significant share of the income of a particular nation. Um, a number of years ago, before this most recent surge in, in immigration to the U.S., I saw an estimate, for example, that uh, national income in Haiti was higher by 5% than it otherwise would have been simply due to migrant remittances. Those remittances enable people back home in the originating country to do certain things, make investments, do other construction projects and so forth that certainly improve their lives there. So that is, on a global scale, that's part of the overall benefit to migration. Um, and indeed, th the immigration is seen as part of a family, broader family strategy to, to enhance well-being for the extended family. Mm -hmm. Matthew is on the line calling from Altoona. Matthew, do you have a question for our guests? Yes, sir. Um, first of all, uh, just a comment. Uh, I, I lived in Central America for a little over three years. And uh, my wife and I, my wife's also from Central America, had, uh, had, you know, we have pretty strong ties to the Latin community. Um, I'm calling from Altoona. There's, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a very diverse uh, Latin community here. But um, in the Virginia, where we were, we, we were, we were pretty tightly knit with the uh, community there. And uh, something, something I noted while, while living in Latin America is that a lot of the, uh, it seemed like a, a lot of the the uh, pressing issues um, earlier on in the 80s, uh, bringing people here to the United States, particularly in countries like Guatemala and El Salvador, um, was the uh, civil unrest there. Uh, but now it seems uh, more, you know, I think you brought this to light, it's, it's more the uh, economic things. But something uh, I don't think that was mentioned that, that's also, you know, having, you know, we try to go back to Latin America fairly frequently, it needs to be mentioned also is the uh, just the um, how things have gotten out of control with, with crime, um, and a lot of people don't just don't feel safe in those countries anymore. And I think if uh, you know if our our uh, guest uh, speakers had had uh, talked with people in Latin America, I think that's a legitimate concern. They do people do feel safer here. Um, the other thing is is that uh, I work in EMS, and uh, what what I'm concerned about is the the possibility that, that uh, major disease outbreaks um, could be crossing our borders. Um, and I, I'm against illegal immigration. I, I think they're, they're in the system really is, needs to be revamped. Um, you know, I was exposed uh, to uh, tuberculosis uh, as an EMT. Well, let, let's, uh, let's put that question to our, our guests. Uh, Dr. Camerata, did you hear his question? Sure. And I do, you, mean, obviously, do you have any thoughts about diseases coming across the border and some of the other issues he raised? Right. I mean, I think that um, I was going to answer the other question about social chaos. Uh -huh. One of the unfortunate legacies of conflict in South America, or Central America, I should say, is um, has been a kind of a rise in kind of social chaos. People who worked for paramilitaries, fought in the Civil War, were orphaned by the Civil War. There, there's been a real increase in social chaos there. And that is a, probably something that's spurring migration independent of, you know, the large income differentials between the United States and, and a place like that. And actually, we see this in Mexico, too. Parts of Mexico have become extremely chaotic and not just at the border. Um, so that also plays a role. Uh, disease has always been a, in a, in a, bi a big concern. Um, and almost certainly it's true that uh, for diseases like um, Chagas disease or tuberculosis or even this recent outbreak of mumps in the Midwest, it's pretty clear that immigration has played a very large role in the resurgence of these kinds of things, or in the case of Chagas disease, mm -hmm. something new into the United States. And uh, disease is something that if you see a total balance sheet of immigration, people usually count, you know, as one of the costs. Well, thank you. Uh, our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242. And the next caller in the queue is George from Mahaffey. Hello, George. Hello. 
How are you doing tonight? Good. Thank you. Uh, my question is, why uh, not seek citizenship? I mean, is there a um, fear that they have to get in as a citizen? Well, let's, gonna, let's put that to Dr. Romero. That's uh, uh, a more complex question than it probably seems on the surface. Would you like to give us a little outline as to how that works, perhaps? Absolutely. Uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, as, a, as a naturalized citizen myself, I, I, have come or, I came originally from the Philippines. I think it's actually a pretty complex question. On the one hand, you want to be part of a nation especially if you have relatives here. Um, myself, I married an American citizen. But on the other hand, I think if one takes seriously the oath uh, of citizenship that one has to take when one naturalizes, uh, you, you, you have to swear, for example, to uh, disavow any foreign potentate. And having grown up in the Philippines, I felt very strongly, for example, about my ties to my home country. And so I think that's a strong emotional uh, hurdle to overcome. So I think that there are real reasons for not wanting to do that, uh, aside and apart from uh, economic or family reasons. Uh, if I may jump in, this yes. is uh, Steve Camerata. Yes, Steve. The, the, the research on citizenship also suggests um, that uh, a person's educational attainment uh, also plays a significant role. I, I agree with my, what my colleague said, but also that immigrants who have relatively little education are the least likely, we're talking legal immigrants here, to, uh, to apply for citizenship because in some ways the system is more likely to look kind of like a black box to them. Um, and familiarity with the language, uh, again, someone with relatively little education is less likely. The people with the most education are those uh, most uh, likely to come forward and get citizenship. So one key predictor of whether someone gets citizenship it means partly their emotional attachment, uh, but also uh, uh, their education level and socioeconomic standing um, also seems to play a pretty significant role in whether a legal immigrant chooses to become a naturalized citizen. I want to uh, bring us back to some of the legal aspects of this and the judicial system that we have surrounding the, the situation. Uh, 20 immigration courts and about 200 immigration judges handled 369,000 cases in 2005. It would appear that we're stretched very thin. And I know some of those judges have, uh, in recent months, come under fire for their faulty handling of immigration cases. Can you comment on how the judicial system for this is set up and maybe give us your own opinion, what you think about it? Sure. First, <laughs> I think it's worth explaining how the system is set up, and, and that is the immigration courts are not like regular federal courts in that the whole idea is they are under the executive branch of the federal government. And so there really isn't the same sort of due process that one gets if one were to be brought in under the federal court system. Uh, they are much more speedy, more informal, and subject to uh, appeals that are less stringent. And because of this, there are lots of claims by uh, people who are studying the system, uh, federal court judges who review some of their opinions, uh, that the system is in fact bro broken and needs to be revitalized. Um, I tend to agree with that. I think that if we're talking about situations, especially if we think about situations where someone might be sent back to a country where he or she might be tortured, and certainly in asylum claims that is a large possibility, I think that there would be a, a strong argument for greater oversight, especially in those types of situations. Ro Robert from Dubois, uh, we have you on the air now. Do you have a, a comment you'd like to make or a short question? I have a little comment to okay. make. Okay. Good. Thank you for taking. I have a little comment to make, and thank you for taking it. Sure. You mentioned the national origins quota system. Well, that served us very well through two world wars, up until this time. And I think we should retain that. My problem is with all of these people that are coming from Central and South America. In 500 years, they have not been able to produce a democratic, free, prosperous country down there. And they're bringing that culture into this country. 
it galls most Americans to see our streets taken over by illegal immigrants. I, for one, think that they have only one right, and that's to go back where they came from. They're not really wanted there. Well, could, could one argue, on the other hand, that those who have come to the U.S. are coming because they like our brand of democracy and want to be a part of it, as opposed to coming here to import that culture that might seem dysfunctional to us from their own country? The problem is there's so many of them that do not want to assimilate into our culture. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been out on the streets creating chaos and uh, all of the other demonstrations that they were doing, waving foreign flags in my country. I, I do not like this at all. In their country, if we'd try and wave an American flag, we'd either get shot or tossed in jail immediately. Okay, well, let's uh, see if any of our guests want to venture a comment on, on that. Well, let me say this. Uh, this is Steve Camerata. Um, yeah. That I think that a very large share of Americans share the caller's concerned. Mm -hmm. on the, let me address the question of assimilation. I don't think it's correct to say that immigrants come to America and don't want to assimilate. I think there are other things going on. One is the numbers are so enormous. Most people estimate that the foreign-born population is about 37 million uh, here. So that's, you know, dramatically greater than at any point in American history. And those numbers themselves may create a certain insularity that hinders assimilation. We also have something else going on, technology. You can fly home. You can call home. Heck, you can listen to your hometown radio station on the Internet. And this probably also hinders the kind of more robust assimilation that many Americans feel that they'd like to see. That psychological tie or even physical tie with the home country isn't broken the way it was 100 years ago when you had to book a steamboat passage back that cost five years' salary. So those two things. And finally, the other big thing that's gone on in America is a fundamental change in elite attitude. There has been a complete breakdown in consensus on what it is that we want from the immigrants. In the past, we wanted immigrants to put aside their old loyalties and come to see America and American history as something they and their ancestors did. Um, but that ideology has been increasingly under attack as a kind of Anglo conformity. So what we have now is a is a change, especially among elites in the United States, about what they're asking for the immigrants. Uh, they get all kinds of conflicted messages. And this also, I think, creates a lot of dissatisfaction on the part of the public. That coupled with technology, that coupled with numbers, also probably creates a more muddled assimilation picture. But finally, the other big difference with this in the past is that we had about 60 years of low immigration. Immigration was very high, 1860 to really 1914. World War I and then restrictive legislation in the 20s dramatically reduced immigration and kept it low for about 60 years. And that probably also greatly facilitated that very large wave of immigrants that came in at that time period. Um, there is no sign yet, although there's deep public dissatisfaction, that we're going to do the same thing now, bring the numbers down uh, uh, anytime soon. Brad from Clarion, you are next on the air. Thanks for joining our program tonight. Hi, how are you guys? Good. Yeah, I was wondering why our government lets all these illegal immigrants in the country, and they first worry about taking care of them instead of worrying about taking care of our own people, like the Vietnam vets, they're homeless on the street, but yet they, they worry about the immigrants first. Okay, let's uh, put that question to our guests. That's uh, an, another sentiment that comes up quite a bit, uh, Dr. Yeah, Romero. Well, I'm, I'm happy to, to take a first stab at mm -hmm. that. I think first it, it's, it's worth thinking about how one becomes undocumented and what it means to be illegal, et cetera. And I think that one should remember that the one's status depends on the law that is applied. So for example, just by way of example, one can come from a, an, any number of Western European nations uh, to this country with little more than a passport. Whereas if one comes from south of the border, say one must have a passport and a visa. So there are things that our government requires by way of policy from different individuals based on the countries from which they hail. And so I think that that, uh, at the outset, uh, makes it different 
uh, for different people or makes it difficult for some people to come into this country in the first in instance as opposed to others. Now on the issue of whether uh, our government cares enough more about uh, Vietnam vets than it does uh, or, or uh, undocumented migrants more than it does Vietnam vets, I uh, really, uh, I, I really can't uh, comment much on that. But. Now the ACLU says that non-citizens, including illegal immigrants, do have constitutional rights. And this is clear without any room for debate from the language of the Constitution itself, 14th Amendment, Due Process Clause, Equal Protection Clause. What would be your response to that statement by I the ACLU? I think that's absolutely clear. If we take a look at the text of the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, which contains both the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause, says that no state shall deny any person due process of law or equal protection of the laws. Now, the framers could have used the word citizen. The framers could have used the word people as it does in the Fourth, fourth Amendment, for example, with respect to searches and seizures. But in specific, the, the uh, framers were concerned about persons. And if you recall uh, history, American history, uh, the Fourteenth Amendment was part of the post-Civil War amendments and really uh, as a means to make sure that the newly free sl freed slaves were given uh, uh, sufficient pr protection. And I think that because of that, we can see that that language uh, is expansive and covers all individuals. Yeah, I, I think, isn't it the case that if you look, I, I actually uh, have looked at that not too long ago at the 14th Amendment. The beginning of the amendment does talk about citizens. It does. And then they switch and talk about persons. So it's, it seemed clear to me as I looked at that that this was not an oversight uh, referring to persons when you meant citizens because the, of the preceding portion that, that really made reference to citizens. If and, I could and answer maybe a different part of the caller's question. Mm -hmm. The caller wants to know why the law is not being enforced. Why do we have so much illegal immigration? And so it's kind of a political question. And, and since I spend all my time here in Washington. Uh, let me answer it this way. It's basically that you have a very odd but formidable coalition that dominates one aspect of immigration here, and that is when it comes to issues around enforcement. The business community, along with ethnic advocacy groups, immigration lawyers, uh, um, libertarians, and some others, generally are able to prevent any effort to enforce the law in the United States. So the Social Security Administration knowingly takes billion, uh, millions of um, bogus Social Security numbers. The, the border is, is, is underfunded. The number of enforcement agents is always less than what the Immigration Service wants. There are 500,000 people in the United States who've been ordered deported. But we don't know if they've left, and most we assume that most haven't. That's called the deportation absconders. You hear about them in the news. This situation arises mainly as a result of conscious decisions made by Congress and successive administrations to do very little in the area of enforcement. And so that's why this situation exists uh, in the sense that... Um, you know, this coalition in Washington. Now, the coalition isn't powerful enough, actually, to get uh, the illegal, some kind of legalization or amnesty, if you like, in the United States. Generally, in that area, public opinion kind of trumps the coalition. So we just go on with this status quo of an illegal population that's thought to grow by four to 500,000 a year, and the law largely unenforced. Thank you. Now, I want to turn to Edgardo, who is on the phone with us, calling from State College. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, I would like to just comment on the person that uh, basically said that if any person from the United States would go to any Hispanic country, he would be uh, shot at. I don't think that is a, a truth at all. And also to say that um, it depends completely on how you, uh, what is the attitude that the government takes when they go over there? I also would like to have uh, ask you the questions now that uh, I am on the air. Yeah, sure. And basically, is uh, many of these immigrants that come here uh, are doing it for uh, some reason, and uh, the reason that they do it is perhaps because their governments are not stable and they do, are not enjoying the security they look for. I was wondering how the international politics of uh, the United States is affecting these countries and how that affects the amount of people that come uh, into this country mm -hmm. here because of that international politics. Many Hispanic countries, including mine, uh, are not 
or to not appreciate the fact that the United States have to check on us to have um, some sort of free uh, election of our president. And uh, because of this reason, I think um, many, Hisp many people from Hispanic countries uh, do not appreciate, not only in Hispanic countries, but also all over the world, do not appreciate the uh, role that the United States is playing in uh, our governments. And I was wondering how this international policy that the United States has uh, have to do with the amount of immigration. I also would like to exhort people to please uh, uh, read a little bit more and inform themselves about the situation of other, uh, of other countries before uh, saying or exposing their point about not liking uh, people from other countries to come Eduardo, over here. Eduardo, what, what country are you from? I come from the Dominican Republic, sir. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been here in the U.S.? I have been for 10 years here and on my way to become a citizen. Uh-huh, great. Well, uh, any comments of, about that, Dr. Romero? Well, sure, yes. I, I think that, first of all, uh, we need to think about this in terms of uh, going back to the economic situation. Uh, certainly, Edgardo raised something that Mr. Camarada, uh, I think, would agree with, and that is to the extent that we're concerned about the influx of uh, immigrants having, especially uh, low-wage immigrants, having a, f a depressing effect upon um, our, our local workers, American workers, then part of the solution has to be to help democracy and economics flourish abroad. And I think that's an important part of the immigration puzzle as well, that if there was the political will to help less uh, developed nations uh, across the world, then we would also be helping to address our immigration problem as well. We have a call from Bradford. Frank, you are on the air with us now. Thanks for calling. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I try to make this uh, uh, quick and maybe a little more general than, than uh, I would otherwise, but mm -hmm. uh, my concern is the fact that there appears to be, not a, appears to be, there is a lack of will on the part of the government to uh, enforce the, um, the laws that are in effect at present time. Um, Americans in general that I talk to are confused by this fact, and most of them crave an orderly process. In particular, uh, most discussions tend to revolve around uh, the security of the border and the southern border and the immigration from Mexico and other Latin American countries. There's very little discussion of efforts by the government to enforce laws in the workplace, including the hiring of illegals, the collection of taxes, and a number of other things. And I wish uh, someone would comment on that. I have some data. As recently as 2004, only four employers were fined for hiring illegals. Some argue that we need to enforce the laws on the books as well as make uh, greater efforts to deny illegal aliens such things as driver's licenses, bank accounts, loans, and in-state college tuition. So I, I think uh, Frank's got uh, an interesting question here about about uh, this, right. uh, Dr. Shapiro. Well, I know that Dr. Camerata has some comments on mm -hmm. this, um, but if I can just jump in initially, I, I think trying to police a very long border is much more difficult than, than trying to do the kinds of interventions that Frank referred to in his question where you really go to the workplace. And I think a lot of this then goes back to the, the sort of coalition that, that Dr. Camerata referred to in response to an earlier question that manages to uh, succeed in keeping enforcement levels uh, well below, you know, at, at low levels. Dr. Camerata? Well, yes, I think everyone who studies it agrees, even if you'd like more legal immigration, everyone recognizes that the centerpiece of your interior enforcement strategy, that is, within the United States, has to be worksite enforcement. That is, going after the employers who hire illegals. Uh, to that end, you would need to create, and there is already one, it's a, it's a pilot program, but apparently it works pretty well, though so there would be challenges if we tried to expand it to the whole country. But a pilot program that, that exists right now uh, is a national database. Uh, we at the Center for Immigration Studies use it. If you want to um, work at the center, we check with um, the Immigration Service, and we determine that you are legally authorized to work in the United States. It includes everyone in the United States. You give us your name, social security number, date of birth, that sort of thing that everyone has to 
give when getting any job, and then you get a verification code back that that person is, in fact, authorized to work in the United States. That would have to be done as well. People who didn't do this, employers, that is, uh, would obviously have to be fined uh, significantly. That would have to be part of, or a big part, I should say, of your enforcement strategy. It's not the only thing. You'd have to be careful at the border. Uh, we think that maybe a third of the illegals in the country didn't sneak into the United States. They came in on temporary visas and never went home. That is, they were supposed to go home after a certain period of time and didn't. You'd have to be more careful who you let in on a temporary basis. There's lots of things that uh, you'd have to do. Um, the border itself is just one piece of a much larger enforcement puzzle. And on this point, I think, though, that there is a real emerging consensus in Washington. Um, but other than that fact, that we do need to make a great deal more effort to enforce the law, there just isn't much agreement on what to do with the illegals here, how many legal immigrants should we let in, in the future, and um, politically this has made it difficult to, um, to come up with uh, any kind of answers. I want to squeeze a couple more callers in here if we can, beginning with Joe from Bradford. Hi, Joe. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Uh, yes, I'm a hard-working gentleman, you know, every day of my life. And I just want to know how and why can these uh, well illegal immigrants come into our country and just you know take our jobs? So, uh, I've been watching the show for a while, mm -hmm. and I think the gentleman in the middle there has been double talking for a while. <laughs> Victor, I think he's referring to you. Uh, yes, I'm happy to. He's been, he's been stirring around a subject. Okay. Doing. Well, let's, uh, you, he'll be candid with us and tell us what he's thinking on that subject. I'll, I'll just give you an example, Joe, if I might. I know, for example, that uh, I've heard stories about uh, two persons from Honduras who walked from Honduras all the way to a restaurant in central Pennsylvania to get work because they knew the work was there. Now, on the one hand, you might say, as, as you have, that, well, that's completely unfair because they didn't get the proper documents to get there in the first place. On the other hand, as Dr. Camarada and Dr. Shapiro have mentioned, you have an employer, on the other hand, who needs the, lab the laborers to do that work. And uh, there, there are many stories, uh, both documented and, and anecdotal, of uh, employers who have said, specifically uh, in agricultural sectors, for example, how they wouldn't be able to get the harvest in if they didn't have these undocumented workers to uh, work. Now, on the one hand, as, as uh, uh, I will acknowledge to you, and if this sounds like double talk, I apologize in advance, but I acknowledge that there is a burden uh, to uh, uh, American workers because of undocumented workers. But on the other hand, one must realize, too, that apparently there is this demand on the part of employers for these uh, workers that isn't being fulfilled by um, uh, American workers. Uh, let me jump in here. This is Steve Camerata. This mm -hmm. is an issue I've spent a lot of share of my professional career studying. I'm one of those people who comes down on the side of the debate, and this is a debate, that there's just no evidence of any kind of a labor shortage in the United States. Wages, and, uh, one of the key measures, uh, have declined significantly for native-born workers who have less than a high school education. They're down 22 percent in the last 23 years. Uh, Native-born workers who have only a high school education, their real wages are down 10 percent in the last uh, decade, the two and a half decades. If there was a shortage of workers, their wages should be going up very quickly. They're not just not going up, they either stagnant or decline. The share of workers who have only, again, a high school degree or less, who are in the labor force, has been declining dramatically in recent years. If you look at the share of workers who are offered benefits by their employers and who don't have a lot of education, that's gone down. In other words, uh, companies are giving less, fewer and fewer employees health care. If there was a terrible shortage, a need, a great demand uh, for an unmet demand for unskilled labor in the United States or less educated workers in the United States, wages and benefits and workforce particip participation should all be going way up, not down. That's all in the opposite direction. Let me leave you with this final statistic. There are 23 million native-born Americans between the ages of 18 and 64 who are either unemployed or not in the labor market, and these are individuals who are either high school dropouts or have only a high school degree. There are 10 million teenagers. 15 to 17 million who are native born in the United States who are not in the labor force and teenage workforce participation rates have been declining dramatically particularly in immigrant receiving cities and states 
So I am extremely skeptical. What we're seeing is a real displacement going on, and what we're seeing also is more educated and affluent Americans saying these immigrants are only taking jobs that Americans don't want. But what they really mean is these immigrants are only taking jobs that I don't want as a more educated or affluent American. For yet one additional perspective, let me read uh, one of several emails we've received. It's from uh, Patrick saying, no one has commented on the revitalizing influence of immigrants. For example, I was recently in Dover, New Jersey, which has a historic downtown which is now almost exclusively Hispanic. I was amazed and delighted the, at the liveliness of the town center with bakeries, restaurants, okay. grocery stores, so when so many other historic American downtowns are so down and out. I also found that I could walk into any of these establishments and was treated very warmly simply by using a little Spanish and showing acceptance. It's a shame so many Americans are threatened by this immigration. Is anything being done on the social program level to cure us of our xenophobia? So yet another perspective. I want to tell you that tonight's program will be stored in an electronic archive that can be accessed through WPSU.org. Thank you to our guests tonight, and good evening from all of us at Penn State Public Broadcasting. Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from ProCopy, leading the way in educational printing and publishing in State College since 1990, now in their new location next to Wiscoy in the Aaron Plaza. Online at ProCopyOnline.com. ProCopy Courseworks. You need copies, we can help. Additional support comes from the members of WPSU. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.